Let's just jump to the point of the video without any unnecessary bullshit. The Judas Contract is the most notable storyline of the 1980s Teen Titans comic book run written by Marv Wolfman and illustrated by the late George Perez. It was literally four years in the making, as the seeds setting it up were sold to the ground in the early issues of the new Teen Titans in November 1980, and the storyline itself began in May 1984. Meaning that during those four years, Wolfman and Perez introduced the readers to their written versions of the Teen Titans, aka Robin, Kid Flash, Wonder Girl and Speedy who had grown up from early teenagers into their late teens, and also brought in new original characters, such as Starfire, Cyborg and Raven, along with Beast Boy, or Changeling as he was also called, who transferred into their team from Doom Patrol. The relevant villain characters to Judas Contract who were also introduced during this run were Deathstroke the Terminator, the criminal organization Holistic Integration for Viral Equality, aka Hive for short, and Terra, who was created to be DC's anti-version of Kitty Pride from X-Men. The reason why Terra was created to be the Judas member of the Teen Titans to betray them for Deathstroke is how this storyline has been remembered for the last about 40 years, and so people have kept trying to redo the storyline in animated or live action media. I should probably note that I never watched the 2003 animated Teen Titans cartoon or its version of Judas Contract, if it even had one, because when I did a quick wiki search I couldn't find a direct reference to any of it, so I will not be talking about that in this video. Instead, I will be majorly focusing on the 2017 released animated movie set in the DC animated original movie universe, with a couple of notices from the third season of Young Justice, where Terra was just a red herring and a background character, and the second season of... Titans. But before that, let's go over the original comic book story, which, by the way, was set to happen before Crisis on Infinite Earths happened in 1985. Okay, a few more things before we start. Number one. Deathstroke's vendetta against the Teen Titans originates itself from the death of his oldest son, Grant Wilson. Grant was a huge fan of his father's alter ego, and in order to become like him, Grant agreed for Hive to kill the Teen Titans. Deathstroke had refused to do the job because they wouldn't pay him an advance. In exchange for Hive giving him power similar to Deathstroke. Long story short, the powers given to Grant didn't work as well as they did with Slade, and using them too much when fighting against the Titans then led to their burden to become the cause of his death. Slade, likely as a mourning father, took the loss of his son that gravely that he instead decided to blame the Titans he died fighting against rather than against Hive for having given Grant poor powers that ended up killing him. And that led to Deathstroke spending the next four real-world years planning his revenge against them. Number 2. The character of Tara Markov, aka Terra, was introduced in the 26th issue of the New Teen Titans as a teenage runaway, and had her first proper meeting with the Titans in issue 28. After she joined them, and when they next had a team up with Batman and the Outsiders, Terra was established to be the younger sister of Geoforce, who had similar earth-bending powers and that then solidified the two siblings to be seen by both teams as trustworthy to have in them. Or something like that, I'm here to review one storyline, not all of them. Okay, this opening is already long enough. Let's let's just get into the comic story now. How the f is it seven issues long? Foi herra jumala. Here is the time code to skip the story recap if you just want to hear what I have to say about the comic. And here is the time code for where I talk about the animated adaptation. Part 1. Crossroads. Okay, the Judas Contract kicks itself off with the Teen Titans, aka Robin, Kid Flash, Donna Troy, Cyborg, Raven, Beast Boy, Slash Changeling, and Terra, raiding one of Hive's heavily militarized outposts in Alaska, 
while talking about what they are doing like there is no tomorrow. They end up in a trap set by Hive and Mother Mayhem, but Cyborg and Beast Boy can get them freed from it, and the Titans defeat the Hive people as a team. Which Terra draws attention towards in saying she still feels like an outsider among them, but Kid Flash is the first one to acknowledge her efforts in their victory over Hive, making her one of them. And then the story immediately jumps into the part where multiple people these days point out why the Judas contract has not aged well. It's Terra reporting the events of this Hive raid to Deathstroke, while they are both dressed in such attires that will make it very hard to describe the context of this scene when I get to the review part. For now, let's just focus on the fact that right after the Titans made it official that Terra is one of them, she is now revealed to be Deathstroke's mole on the inside, having worn contact lenses that recorded everything she saw. They talk about Hive and what the Titans are doing to combat their activities, before being joined by William Wintergreen, Slade's best friend and comrade. While the old men talk, Terra notices a framed picture of a younger Slade with his ex-wife and two sons, whom he dismisses as a part of his old life long time ago, and Wintergreen defends Slade's ex-wife's honor when Terra throws a shade at her. Slade takes that as the initiation for them to go do some field training, which is probably meant to showcase for the standalone readers of how powerful Terra is as an Earthbender, and how well Deathstroke's agility is while strategizing what moves to make in order to reach her. The way how they interact in the end of it here also makes it look like Terra was either holding back, or she doesn't need to lift her finger much for using her powers this much. Slade then sends Terra back to her undercover work, which she impatiently declares to want to be over. And returning to the Titan's Tower, Terra meets a civilian cloth Wally West, who tells her he has something to announce. Converging with the other Titans, it is revealed that they were all planning to reveal their secret identities to Terra here now. And Wally's own announcement is that he will be retiring from his Kid Flash activities because he feels like he needs to grow up from a childish fantasy existence by going back to college. The other Titans, and Terra, respect Wally's decision, which then leads to Dick declaring that he is also going to give up on being Robin. He also wants to grow up, and knowing that being Robin will always have him be half of Batman and, which he cannot be anymore if he is not fighting at Batman's side. And the pre-crisis Jason Todd had been introduced around this time too, by the way, so Dick likely feels like it's time for him to pass the torch. He is not going to quit on being a Titan, however, and for some reason while letting Terra know that he is Dick Grayson, Dick also decides to strip out of his Robin costume in front of everyone, and this show is also witnessed by Slade and Wintergreen, who get all the intel they need. This issue ends with Dick and Cory seeing Wally off with his then-current girlfriend as they drive off into the night. Part 2. Lifeblood The next part of Judas contract opens with Mother Mayhem initiating more members into Hive on their controlled island of Zandia on the Baltic Sea, and letting them witness the ascension of Brother Blood from what looks, and is said to be boiling blood. Then there is a scene showing Terra at Beast Boy's stepdad's mansion in the Hamptons, showing how close they are now, and Garfield's antics cause his sixth private tutor to quit. Garfield's stepdad appears to remind him that the tutors were hired so he could be with the Titans, and that if Garfield causes the next one to quit, then he will be thrown into the public school system. After that character moment, Beast Boy and Terra fly to join the other Titans, having a debate on live television with American politicians who want to send military aid to the island nation under Hive's control. And Brother Blood is shown being interviewed from Zandia, speaking for the local president, whom those weapons are really for, while looking like this. The Titans are able to see through the Hive's bullshit, but their audience is captivated by Brother Blood's charisma and manipulation. 
leading to the Titans to lose the debate because Dick cannot take over their debate in his civilian identity now that he is not Robin anymore. This pretty much makes them realize that they need to find concrete evidence on Brother Blood and Hive's crimes to stop their operations. And then here next, we have Dick in a disguise approaching those people who bought what Brother Blood was selling and are moving to Zandia so they can join Hive, asking that they can take him with them. Unfortunately, when arriving, Mother Mayhem is able to see through his disguise, which alerts the Titans to come help him, and the issue ends with them all walking into a trap where Brother Blood shows them Dick seemingly converted into Hive. Part 3. Baptism of Blood This chapter of Judas Contract opens with the Titans at Brother Blood's mercy and to be submerged into what is indeed confirmed to be a pool of boiling blood. Draven tries to use her powers as an empath on Brother Blood without any success, but Terra is able to use her earthbending powers to mold the cave walls and rocks they are restrained onto, and ultimately free the Titans to charge at their captors. Brother Blood and his congregation is still able to retreat by leaving the Titans to fight this morphing lair and whatever the hell this is supposed to be. After Starfire destroys it and Raven reveals that Brother Blood was only toying with them, they manage to catch up with him and his followers thanks to Terra's powers. And then Brother Blood declares that if the Titans want to shut him down, then he will confront them personally. Before that, we are shown how the local Zandian authorities are pushing back against Hive's missionaries and recent converts. Then we return to the Titans, who instead of going all on one against Brother Blood, are made to fight against Hive's killer robots. Raven lets them know that the robots have no life in them, and Starfire attacking them causes the robots to blow up on contact. That leads to Terra using her earthbending powers to make the cave walls wall the spectators off from them and the robots. The Titans go all out against the robots while also being confused at what Brother Blood could want with this distraction. And voy herra jumala, it's seriously challenging to try to describe what is happening here. Getting out of that protective sphere, Brother Blood fools Starfire, Donna Troy, Terra and Beast Boy to charge at a trap that only Cyborg can see, and then Raven is taken out by Brother Blood sneaking up on her, while Cyborg himself is paralyzed, I guess. And Brother Blood then claims that he won against the Titans like this. Meanwhile, the Zandian military is storming towards Brother Blood's public temple, where he is trying to force the brainwashed Dick Grayson into pressing the button to the machine where the Titans are constricted into. But with Batman's training, probably, and the power of friendship slash love, Dick is able to resist Brother Blood's control and instead releases his friends to save him and fight Brother Blood as the Zandian military attacks the temple. In the end, Brother Blood is assumed to be dead and he is seen as a martyr honored by the newly converted American politicians and other countries of the world who are welcoming the disciples of Blood's church in. This issue ends with the Titan suspect that Brother Blood may have planned for all this to happen and got exactly what he wanted. Part 4 The Eyes of Tara Markov. And this fourth part is pretty much the calm before the storm section of the story told from Terra's point of view as Tara Markov, and everything she sees is recorded as Intel with her contact lenses. Here she is shown spending time with the other Titans in their civilian lives, like how Cory is posing as a model for Donna to photograph before having a dinner date at Donna's and Cory's apartment with Dick, Garfield and Donna's fiancé Terry Long, who may or may not have been Marv Wolfman's self-insert character. Here Garfield suggests that Donna and Terry could have their wedding at his stepfather's estate, and as those plans are decided, Donna among other things asks Tara to be her bridesmaid after Raven declined. After that, Tara and Garfield walk Dick to his apartment, so passing its address to Slade, and then they pass Victor spending time with a school of handicapped children, who see him as one of them with his body augmentations in the park. When the class is over, Victor joins Garfield and Tara as they walk him home too, and Tara manages to get some personal information from Victor to be sent to Destro. 
After they leave and their paths divert, Tara decides to emotionally manipulate Garfield by kissing him before she takes the raft to the Titan's Tower. There Tara has a confrontation with Raven, who implies with her empathic powers that she has always sensed corruption and inner evil inside Tara, which along with how her powers work are also recorded for Deathstroke. The next day, the Titans are doing training sessions, which Terra also records to Deathstroke as intel on their fighting techniques, and then comes Terra's sparring match against Beast Boy. It's supposed to be a friendly match. But after Tara kissed Garfield the previous day, Beast Boy takes it a little too far in thinking he can humiliate Terra in the fight with flirty behavior, which only makes Terra respond with aggression and excessive use of her earthbending powers, to the point where Beast Boy is knocked unconscious and Cyborg has to defend him while Donna and Starfire have to restrain Terra. Raven arrives reminding Terra of what they spoke of the previous day, seeing how she almost seemed to be trying to kill Beast Boy, but Terra is able to put up an excuse of Beast Boy's actions triggering her PTSD from before she was taken in by the Titans, which Deathstroke is also able to see. Later Deathstroke reprimands Tara for having almost broken her cover, but otherwise Slade is content on having complete files on all of the Titans now thanks to her undercover work. Now it is their time to move forward in completing the contract Slade's son Grant accepted with Hive, whose reminiscence is seen by Tara as Slade being soft, but Slade brushes it off by saying it is time they begin the real work. This issue ends with Slade and Tara regrouping with Wintergreen as they depart from wherever this place is. No, this location is never mentioned in the comic, but if they are anywhere in the US, it better be one of those states where the legal age of consent is 16. As Slade and Wintergreen disclose that this could be their final contract, they are revealed to be spied upon by an older woman and a young blonde man. Part 5. Betrayal Okay, here is where the story begins to pick itself up. As Deathstroke is shown ambushing Dick Grayson in his apartment, and shocking Dick by knowing he knows who he is. Or was. They fight as Dick's apartment is torn apart, and Deathstroke is proven to be the superior combatant, which forces Dick to flee through the window and survive by sacrificing his $300 leather jacket. As Dick flees into a park, Deathstroke is forced to pull his punches not to endanger civilians outside of his contract, which is seen and commented by the woman and the young man here named as Joseph, as Deathstroke getting sloppy. That is probably how Dick is able to lose Deathstroke in the crowds in the park, and after Deathstroke leaves unable to find him, Dick rushes to Donna's and Cory's apartment, which has already been attacked with a mail-delivered bomb. Realizing that Cory was taken, Dick rushes to Donna's photography studio and finds Donna also gone, having been taken out by the foreign assets in her photo development tools. Younger viewers, feel free to ask your parents what this pre-smartphone era of technology is. Then Dick rushes to Victor's apartment to find him taken as well, before going to the Titan's Tower to find Raven missing, and evidence of Terra's earthbending powers having been used there in a fight. And then he is approached by the older woman, who introduces herself as Adeline, and the young Joseph as her son, who tell Dick that Raven was taken from the tower by Terra, who is working with Destro. Dick naturally does not believe them, and contacts Garfield at his stepdad's estate, to learn that he has been taken by Destro as well. In the final scenes of this issue, Adeline discloses to Dick that she knows Deathstroke's real name is Slade Wilson, because he was her husband and Joseph's father. And in an epilogue part, Deathstroke contacts Hive on his way to one of their strongholds, that he is bringing the Titans to them to end Grant's contract. Part 6. There shall come a Titan. This issue opens with Dick questioning how Adeline can expect him to believe what she says with her claims, knowledge and confession of being Deathstroke's wife. Adeline simply tells Dick to think about everything she has told him and seeing that she is making sense causes Dick in his frustration of it to ask why isn't Joseph saying anything before being told by his mother to be mute and then she starts telling a long story. 
a long story, which is why I'm doing this video as a follow-up to my Batman and Sons of Batman video. Adeline tells Dick how she first met Slade Wilson as his commanding officer at Camp Washington, where Slade had joined the army at the age of 16 by lying about his age. During his military training, Slade excelled in everything he did, which was what caused Adeline to take a shine to him in the first place, and personally train him to graduate as a lieutenant colonel, and learn that the closest thing he had to a family before her was Major William Wintertree. Eventually, Slade and Adeline grew close enough to get married, but instead of having a honeymoon, Slade was deployed to Vietnam, remember that this story took place in 1984, while Adeline was pregnant with their first son, Grant. Then one day, Major Wintergreen came to inform Adeline that Slade had volunteered for an experimental adrenocorticotropic hormone test, which was supposed to build resistance against proof serums, and after a painful episode that almost landed Slade into a desk duty, he came out of it with superhuman abilities. Pretty much similar to Captain America. By the time Joseph was born, Slade had rejoined the military after learning that Wintergreen had been captured by the Viet Cong, and after rescuing him then moved into becoming a big game hunter. When he was at home, Slade was a good father in raising Grant to idolize him, and being supportive of Joseph's musical inspirations, while also hosting parties with his hunting buddies, or so Adeline thought, until their home was invaded by gunmen looking for Deathstroke and kidnapped Joseph, which forced Slade to reveal to Adeline what he was really doing on his hunting trips. Assassination missions that only he was capable of doing thanks to his powers, and those missions had caused Joseph to be taken now. While Slade promised to Adeline that he would save their son, the confrontation with the kidnappers did not go well, as they wanted information Slade had also promised not to reveal, and so Slade's My word is my bond. Code of conduct came into a conflict, which he tried to resolve by gambling with his spear to save Joseph, but unfortunately, while the boy was rescued alive, his throat was slashed open enough to damage his vocal cords, and so render him mute. As being Deathstroke had been more important to Slade than his son's safety and well-being, Adeline confronted Slade, whose excuses ended up causing her to try and fail killing him. And that is the reason why Deathstroke only has one eye as a symbolic scar of how he failed on his family. This finishes Adeline's story to Dick in helping him understand Deathstroke better as his and Titan's enemy, before explaining that she and Joseph only found out about Slade working with Terra recently. As they know where Deathstroke is taking the Titans for Hive, Dick asks them to take him there too, but before that he has to sue it up. And this is where that historical event, where Dick Grayson for the first time took up the mantle of Nightwing, with this whole page being dedicated to the introspection that multiple writers later used to retell how it happened. And this is what the Nightwing costume originally looked like before the latter half of the 1990s gave us the black and blue default version. Adeline also reintroduces Joseph to Nightwing now as Jericho, and reveals that he has power to take over and possess people's bodies, something that she has also kept Deathstroke from knowing. This issue ends with Nightwing and Jericho leaving to go after Deathstroke and Hyde to rescue the Titans, and Adeline is left behind with a simple smile on her face. Part 7. Finale. The final issue of Judas Contract opens in a hive base somewhere in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, where Deathstroke has brought the Titans to be restrained into some kind of machine, which hive operatives claim to be siphoning their powers. When Donna asks why Deathstroke is working with Hive, Slade admits that as a mercenary he wouldn't normally take contracts that involve hunting heroes like them. But since his son died fighting against them, Bring the Titans to Hive was a personal mission he had to do. And then to shock them even more, Deathstroke reveals Terra to them as whom he had working among them as his Judas, with Terra now speaking down on them without needing to act like she is their friend anymore. 
Meanwhile, Nightwing and Jericho are making their way into Hive's base in the mountains, while Hive tells Deathstroke and Terra that his contract included bringing Robin and Kid Flash as well. As Wally is not Kid Flash, and so not a Titan anymore, Deathstroke just tells them that he has Wintergreen trying to track down Robin, who as Nightwing has managed to infiltrate the Hive base, and Wintergreen when called by Deathstroke is revealed to be held at a gunpoint by Adeline. And while she has Wintergreen at her mercy, Adeline also asks why he has been standing by Slade's side all the way to this contract. Wintergreen responds by telling Adeline the story of how Slade rescued him from the Viet Cong, who had captured him on a suicide mission that he had been sent on as a punishment for disobeying order to send Slade on it. And as Slade had been forbidden from going to rescue Wintergreen by the military, he had created his Deathstroke persona to rescue Wintergreen, which cemented their best friendship. Which Slade truly needed after Adeline had shot him, because without his family waiting for him at home anymore, Slade became colder, distant, and after Grant died, obsessed with his partnership with Terra, then making him act self-destructively. Flirting of Wintergreen's loyalty to her husband causes Adeline then to realize that she never loved Slade as much as his best friend does. What? No homo. Nightwing and Jericho have infiltrated their way closer into the Hive base by now, and disguise themselves as being part of Hive as they make their way closer to the Titans. And then they have to fight when the Hive operative that Jericho took over begins to resist his control. They fight their way through Hive operatives until Terra overpowers them, and has the Hive take them to the other Titans while Deathstroke is clearly past done with his contract. When he is then called to see Nightwing and Jerry captive, Slade is shocked to see his other, still living son as a Hive captive. And when Terra recognizes him from the pictures she has seen, Jericho takes over Slade's body and begins to use it to fight against Hive, hitting Terra in the process and releases the Titans from their captivity. And as Terra doesn't know about Jericho's powers, she sees Slade hitting her as betrayal, which leads to a mental breakdown in trying to kill Slade and the Titans who are fighting against Hive now. Most of the following pages are then pretty much an action scene of the Titans fighting against Hive, and Slade, while possessed by Jericho, trying to get Terra to stop trying to kill him, by explaining what is going on. But even when Jericho lets go and Terra sees him face out of Slade's body, Terra doesn't care. And while I understand what Marv Wolfman was probably trying to do when writing Terra like this, her rants here are beginning to go too far in portraying her mental breakdown. Eventually, the Titans begin to try reach out to Terra and calm her down, even blaming Deathstroke for having corrupted her against them, but that was never the case. After confessing that she used all the time she was with them to get intel on them to Deathstroke and Hive, the Titans finally see Terra as the evil person she is, which Raven had already sensed a couple of issues ago. That then causes Terra to attack Raven and the rest of the Titans, to which Beast Boy responds by flying into her eye as a small insect to blind her, and cause Terra to start using her powers just to lash out here and there, eventually causing so much bent earth to fly around that she is buried under it. The Titans later try to dig her out while debating over whether Deathstroke had used her, or if she had been using Deathstroke, whom they have already restrained and is being watched over by Jericho, with both of them just remembering better days. After Dick has reintroduced himself to them as Nightwing, the Titans find Terra's remains, and the next day she is buried with Batman and the Outsiders attending her funeral, without being told of how Terra really died. Adeline and Joseph oversee the funeral and comment about not letting Geoforce know his sister died as a villain before Adeline suggests Joseph to join the Titan as the new hero Jericho. 
Okay, let's go over the narrative first. The Judas contract is told somewhat well, but the first three issues of it feel like they were padding the story too much. It might be because of the two scenes of Slade and Terra why I originally remember this being a four issue story, where the first and fourth issues were the same before I reread it. But I suppose it was important for there to be a separate conflict that somehow tied into what happened in the latter half. Especially if you are just focusing on this one story on its own, and not on the entire run from the beginning. The writing by Mark Wolfman was pretty good in building up the narrative set up from the first issues of his run, and the dialogue, which I did not pay that much attention while recapping the story, was solid enough for all the characters in showing how good of an understanding Wolfman had of everyone he was writing. However, since this comic was written in the 1980s, it unfortunately is somewhat dated to that era, like how we see people using landline phones, Donna's photography studio using old-fashioned photography development methods, and the fact that Deathstroke and Wintergreen are veterans of the Vietnam War. And art-wise, I would probably be insulting the memory of George Perez if I started to criticize any of the perfection that man drew during his lifetime. While this run on the new Teen Titans he did with War Woman is his earlier work, before masterpieces like Christ on Infinite Earth, the 1987 reboot of the Wonder Woman comics, and whatever he did while working for Marvel. Even the worst parts of it look good in framing the scenes and pacing how the story moves forward. What a great artist did we lose in his passing. And before moving forward to the adaptation, let's go over the three important things that happened in this comic. Number one. Judas Contract was the original version of the events that caused Dick Grayson to quit being Robin and transition into becoming Nightwing, which unfortunately too many other writers since then have for some reason decided to retcon slash rewrite into having happened because he had a falling out with Batman instead. Examples such as the Old Wounds episode from Batman the Animated Series gets a pass, because the Teen Titans were not established to exist in the DCAU, and it was pretty much an excuse made up for the sake of it because they needed Dick to become Nightwing somehow. It still ended up becoming the default backstory in the mainstream comics when Chuck Dixon ended up doing the Nightwing Year One storyline, and thanks to the Titans TV show, we are now stuck with this meme. Fuck that man. Number two, it told the origin story of Deathstroke four years after his introduction and established what price he had to pay to become who he was. It also introduced his family that made him be seen as a layered character more than as a one-dimensional villain. Which also, unfortunately, too many other writers since then have for some reason rewritten slash retconned him to be, while pretending like his family either doesn't exist, or that some of his kids do not exist, or that he was born with just one eye. There have been some other understandable changes too, since having him being a Vietnam War veteran in decades after could not work anymore, but in most cases, he has been an augmented former US soldier, and a failed bastard of a father and husband. But not an incel former member of the League of Assassins who is bitter over Ra's al Ghul choosing Batman as his successor, and the father of his grandson instead of him like in the Son of Batman movie. Number 3. And then there is the character of Terra. Voi hyvää päivää, how do I undo this mess? As I mentioned in the beginning, Terra was created to be DC's anti-version of Kitty Pride from X-Men, and so, while looking like an adorable young girl struggling to make friends with other heroes, she was everything but that. While her introduction would have taken too long for me to include here, Terra in her first scene in the Judas Contract is pretty much a prime example of subverted expectations. She first appears fighting along with the Titans, and her interactions with them reveal that Terra is the newest member among them, while also reinforcing that they are all making an effort in helping her feel like she is one of them. 
And then it is immediately revealed that she is working with Deathstroke as a mole inside the Titans to establish that Terra is not their friend. She hates and despises them and is 100% behind betraying them for Deathstroke. While this characterization is not looked back upon favorably by most people, who see Terra as a young girl being taken advantage by an older man, Wolfman and Perez knew from the moment they created her that Terra was to be a malignant narcissist who believed that heroes should rule the world as villains. Unfortunately, because of adaptations like the 2003's Teen Titans cartoon, which I seem to be the only one who did not grow up watching it, Terra has been since rewritten slash reimagined without her psychological issues that originally had her be an irredeemable villain. And since some people might have a problem in differentiating the two, we end up getting retcons to the Judas contract that ignore Deathstroke's characterization in it, so they can reframe Terra as a tragic victim, rather than as the evil villainess she was created as instead. Which should explain why the 2003 cartoon had Deathstroke reduced into just going by his first name, and being portrayed like he was an inhumane robot without ever even taking his mask off. And with that, it's probably the time to move on to the 2017 animated adaptation. But before that, I feel like I need to say this one more time. This Terra is not the same as this Terra. Before I rewatch this animated movie, I was somewhat prepared to tear it apart because I remembered from my previous viewing so many things that went against what I just spent about 30 minutes talking about. However, after rewatching the movie again now, I feel like I was hit with an emotional whiplash as this movie ended up doing so many things right, only to then do so many other things wrong. One example is how the movie opens with a 5 years ago flashback which could be seen as a nod to how the Judas contract was four real-world years in the making. The flashback has five younger titans, three of whom who are not even in the rest of the movie by the way, and how they first met Starfire. That is the right thing done, but considering how this setup does not include anything else for the rest of the film, and how Kid Flash, Speedy, and Bumblebee are not seen ever again after this, that is the wrong that was done with it. The next scene set in the present day is almost a scene-by-scene -scene faithful recreation of the opening of Judas Contract, where the Titans, Nightwing, Starfire, Beast Boy, Raven, Blue Beetle, Filling for Cyborg, Damian, Wayne's Robin, and Terra are raiding a hive base. Donna Troy is also in this movie, but she is introduced later, just before the end credits, as a younger character than Nightwing and Starfire, which is a little weird in knowing she is supposed to be closer to the same age as them. After that, the movie then decides to do some changes to the narrative by rearranging some scenes here and there. The revelation of Terra working with Deathstroke does not happen until later, near the halfway point, probably because the director Sam Liu and writer Ernie Altbacker fell victim to that exact thing I spoke of earlier in deciding to modify Terra's characterization from the source material. And like I said before, they ended up doing some things right, while unfortunately also ending up with a lot of changes that went wrong with her. For a few improved examples, the tantrum Terra ends up throwing in her training session with Beast Boy is presented somewhat better justified in showcasing Terra's fragile mentality with PTSD flashbacks, which Beast Boy triggered with his behavior, and the scene of her kissing him is played in after that when he apologizes to her. The movie also pushes a lot harder to make the Titans pull an effort in making Terra feel like she is one of them. Outside of just acknowledging her efforts and being comfortable in letting her know their real names, the Titans also throw Terra a party in celebrating her first year with them. That did indeed make Terra feel conflicted over her commitment on wanting to betray the Titans to Deathstroke and Hive. 
of whom I should probably now talk about next. As this movie is unfortunately set in the DC animated original movie universe, it is forced to follow the movies that came before it, like by having Dick Grayson already be Nightwing as he was introduced back in the Son of Batman movie. And thanks to the Son of Batman's other previous establishment, this adaptation of Judas Contract does not have Deathstroke in it, but rather that incel former member of the League of Assassins impersonating Deathstroke. Even when he is recast with the late Miguel Ferrer in his final role, this character is still nothing like Deathstroke in anything but name and appearance. So, that means we don't have Wintergreen, Adeline, Grant, or Joseph as the part of the story serving up as Slade's motivation and moral compass in hunting the Titans for Hive. Literally, the only reason he has in going after the Titans at all, which the comic version said to be bad for business, is because Damian Wayne's Robin is one of them. And Damian is also the first member of the Titans whom the Deathstroke impersonator captures. Meaning that he has no emotional investment in going after the rest of them anymore. Speaking of his emotional investment, in the comic, Slade was portrayed to be somewhat tranquil when planning and speaking about going after the Titans, as if he didn't fully want to commit to the contract and was only doing it for the memory of his dead son. And speaking of his dead sons, the film's Wikipedia page confirms that this is supposed to be Joseph, whose mere existence in it, and then being killed by Mother Mayhem, should break the entire premise of the movie in making Deathstroke turn against Hive. Like he passively almost did when he realized that his other son had been taken captive along with Nightwing and Slade, physically demanded Hive to release the boy to him before Joseph took over his body. This character is a game-breaking anomaly that should not have existed in the movie at all. Especially when he was what woke Slade from the tranquility he was under during most of the comic, and essentially served as his Martha moment. And Hive then ends up being a mixed bag of doing the exact same thing as everyone else. The live debate from the second part with the Titans and Hive is reduced into just being a TV interview on Brother Blood, after which he then has the interviewer killed. The Zandia mission is reduced into just being a remote mission in hunting down a Hive scientist, who ends up getting killed by Deathstroke's drones thus making sure that Brother Blood will be alive for the finale and does not seemingly die to be seen as a martyr. That latter part is actually an improvement, which continues with his inclusion in the finale in explaining what that machine that the Titans were confined into was supposed to do. Assimilate their powers and pass them on to Brother Blood, so he could be the final boss for the Titans to fight, while the Deathstroke impersonator and Terra fight because... Because this movie was forced to drop the ball harder with that plot point by almost acknowledging that this Deathstroke impersonator is not as smart as the real Deathstroke. Leading up here, the way how the Deathstroke impersonator and Terra capture the Titans is mostly done with faithful and updated recreations, even when Cyborg had to be replaced with Blue Beetle and he was taken out pretty much the same way. The Deathstroke impersonator attacking Dick Grayson in his apartment is almost perfect, except that Dick is on his guard when attacked, and he is then unable to lose the Deathstroke impersonator from catching him. Meaning that Dick has to fake his death so the Deathstroke impersonator would stop hunting him, when the comic clearly had his contract be Bring the Titans dead or alive. Meaning that when Dick fell down from this pier, the Deathstroke impersonator should have dived in after him and dragged Dick's would-be corpse along with him to Hive. Then without him, or Kid Flash and Donna who are not in this movie, Hive tells the Deathstroke impersonator that his contract is incomplete without Nightwing, 
and the impersonator then sells out Terra to them as a replacement, aka does the exact opposite of what the comic Deathstroke did. This is essentially the same thing I spoke about in my Batman and Sons of Batman video. The story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story. The dynamic between the Deathstroke impersonator and Terra is then hard to describe as this movie tries and ultimately fails to balance it out in this adaptation. Especially their relationship, which was uncomfortable to comprehend in the comic too, but at least there it was just a background implication passively presented in the narrative without drawing too much attention to it, until later at this exact point of the story, where Terra began to rant about it during her mental breakdown where she thought Slade had betrayed her, exactly like how the Deathstroke impersonator betrayed her in this movie, and then she dies similarly, but not in the exact same way as in the source material. The Deathstroke impersonator also seems to give in to his fate and lets himself die along with her as the Titans escape, and later they come back to retrieve Terra's body which somehow stayed alive long enough to be found, and then dies in Beast Boy's arms, as his voiceover is heard with him telling an abridged version of these events to Kevin Smith. Okay, and now I try to talk about that giant elephant in the room. <laughs> Seeing how the Deathstroke impersonator was not presented to be in a state of tranquility as the comic book Slade was, the impersonator was completely active with the relationship he had with Terra. And while Terra in that one scene of them in the movie was shown proactive while the impersonator kept pushing her aside with promises of later, it is not exactly confirmed or denied if they had or had not done anything illegal in those states where the age of consent is the default, aka 18. Either way, it is creepy and uncomfortable to talk about. I'm also not defending the comic version of Slade, who may or may not have in his tranquility given in to comic Terra seductions. Or the fact that this location where they were regrouping in wasn't confirmed to be or not to be a state where the age of consent is Terra's age. I am, however, Recognizing a certain bias that Marv Wolfman seemed to have grown with the character when he wrote Slade forward here from Judas Contract, as more like the man Adeline had described from before Joseph's kidnapping. In a later storyline, Slade and Beast Boy had a confrontation where Slade arrived out of costume as an unarmed man, and instead of fighting, they sat down and talked like civilized people. As Wolfman wrote this, I see it more as his established canon for the characters he created, rather than later retcons written by other people. While the conversation between Slade and Garfield brushes aside the part where Garfield asks Slade if he ever did the illegal thing with Terra, Wolfman seems to acknowledge that he is uncomfortable with that plot point as well and likely through Slade wants to tell the readers, who are represented by Garfield, that these people are fictional characters, and that part of the story is over, so it doesn't matter. George Perez did not agree with Wolfman with this message, however, as he clearly did not draw the issue where this meeting took place. Mistakes were made, and we should all learn from them, and Slade also kept his word in promising Garfield not to come after the Titans again after this. Up until 2003, when different writers other than War Wolfman decided to want to have him be a villain again. While I am uncomfortable and wish not to think about this whole thing any more than I have to, the comic version of Slade was thus written with more belated maturity, and the Deathstroke impersonator in comparison flip-flopped back and forth to get the story to a similar ending as in the source material. 
And at this point in the end, I feel like the Judas contract, for all the cultural impact it did have since the 80s, should be left in the 80s. If this movie adaptation was not set in the DC animated original movie universe, it could have maybe had better adapted the seven issues I recapped closer to its source material with those actually good changes. Unfortunately by now that train has left the station and it's too late to do a better adapted version of it. Better leave it behind along with any attempts to fix Terra also. The best that should be taken from Duda's contract is to acknowledge the more positive and mature aspects of Dick Grayson's transitioning from Robin to Nightwing and pay more attention to Deathstroke's supporting characters to make more faithful adaptations in going forward. The second season of the now HBO Max's Titans TV show was the closest it could have been along with the Knights and Dragons animated movie. But they both ended up committing the cardinal sin of essentially HAKAIING Grant from existence and making Slade only have one eye before Joseph became mute and Adeline divorced him. And now I'm too tired of talking about the Judas contract anymore. Leave likes to acknowledge the insane amount of work I put into this video. Comment what you have to say about both versions of the story, share the video to have more people bring me feedback, and subscribe for future videos. Also, ding the bell for when I do gameplay streams so you can have a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.